Hello, this is Ruben from Property Solvers and welcome to another podcast. Today, I'm really excited to get the opportunity to speak with Maria Harris from the Open Property Data Association. How are you doing, Maria? Yeah, amazing. Thank you. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Um, yeah, and a big thanks for, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Nice so um, it's been really interesting to see a real push that's happening in the home buying and selling space to digitise property transactions. And Maria is at the forefront of some of the key transformations happening across the industry. So perhaps to start, Maria, could you give us a little bit of background um, into you know, how you uh, came to be part of the Open Property Dating Association and, and, and chair it? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so I guess like potted history of me. Um, so I joined the mortgage industry in 2005, um, which feels like forever ago. It's been a long 20 <laughs> years. Lots has happened. Yeah. Um, before that, I actually used to manage contact centres. So I worked for British Airways up in the northeast, used to manage part of the sales function up there. Um, and then I worked in utilities for NPower and managed contact centres in the northeast. Um, so I guess growing up in a contact centre environment is very consumer obsessed, very consumer centric, but lots of kind of fast moving change, lots of projects tend to be at the front end, the kind of leading end of like new technology and that kind of stuff. And then I fell into mortgages in 2005, as you do, um, absolutely loved it, loved the intermediary market, loved mortgage lending, um, loved how dynamic the industry was. And then I ended up staying um, a bit longer than planned. But 10 years ago, um, I um, was asked by a friend of mine if I would come and help create the UK's first digital bank, which was Atom Bank, um, which was such an amazing opportunity. And my role there was to design and build the UK's first digital mortgage, um, which was just the most fabulous thing to do. It was great fun. Um, so we spent two years building and designing and testing and we went live and it was just the most phenomenal success. Amazing customer journey, really amazing digital journey. Um, and, you know, all of the stuff that you see from Atom Bank now, like one in five Five customers get a mortgage offer in 14 seconds when wow. the industry average is about 15 days and it's just NPS off the scale and like just the most beautiful customer journey um so while we were doing that because we were the first digital bank we kind of got invited to um get involved in all sorts of projects and, and things that were going on at the time so obviously open banking was just kicking off then wow. um and getting through its launch in the UK which obviously the UK were the first country in the world to do open banking um, we had land registry who were running digital street um, at that time, I think that was about 2016, um, which was to look at whether or not land registry could actually be moved onto a distributed ledger um, and what that would mean if we digitised the land registry at source. And there was a bunch of stuff with universities around, you know, how we use better technology to improve transparency and put trust back into the market on the back of the global financial crisis. And on the back of all of that, um, there was also a government inquiry in 2017 by Bayes to say, we've had all of this technology, we've got all of these amazing things that are happening. So why is the home buying process still so bad? Like, why is it still so slow? And when I joined the industry in 2005, it used to take on average about 12 weeks to go from mortgage offer to completion. And that was kind of normal. It took three months to buy a house. By the time that inquiry was done in 2017, 17 it increased to an average of 16 weeks and now we're in 2024 and the average is 22 weeks and um, which is horrific yeah. and I'm sure we'll come on to that later but at that time in 2017 so Bayes did this report why is it still so bad and one of the recommendations one of the government's responses to the findings was to set up um, an industry and government collaboration group which was home buying and selling group um, so they've been running six years and they're the reason that I've ended up getting involved in all of this digitizing the property market. They asked me if I could help um, and yeah, just jumped in with both feet and, and yeah, kind of went from there. Interesting. Yeah. I know you recently gave evidence at the levelling up select committee on that particular issue that there's been negligible progress on digitizing the home buying and selling experience. I mean, why do you think, you know, it's actually ended up slowing down in recent years? Yes, I mean, what was interesting and the reason that it was really good to give evidence at that select committee was because as part of that government response in 2018, so setting up the home buying and selling group has been great and we've made some really amazing progress and they did things like navigated us through COVID, through the lockdown and enabled the market to open up and they've done lots on things like building safety and cladding issues and all of that kind of stuff. So they do all of this amazing work. 
but there was a second piece of the recommendations which was around how we start taking um principles of data and technology and unlocking the things in the market that are really frustrating and really cumbersome and just antiquated right. and it's because if you look at the history of, of mortgages and buying a home it's it's a paper-based process and always has been and the market's very siloed so you're you know you say your mortgage intermediary your bank manager or whoever it used to be back in the day and um, building society building you know office manager you would agree your mortgage and then somebody else would do the legal work and then the, you had land registry who did their bit and you had the estate agent who did their bit and the customer journey's kind of grown organically from there in silos. So as we've moved from paper to electronic, all we've done is done the same, but in silos, we've not actually re-looked at the customer journey end to end and said, how do we work collaboratively and together to digitize this from beginning to end? So that was one of the things that was recognized in that response in 2018. And part of the government's commitment then was to say, we absolutely need to start by digitizing our own data. So property data at source, which is predominantly mm -hmm. land registry, local authorities, other government departments, if you think about things like council tax register, searches, um, uh, coal authority data, that kind of stuff. It's all owned by different government departments mm -hmm. or by local authorities. And then you've got some that's owned by industry, but the majority's central or local government and the commitment was that they would digitize their own data at source and then start enabling this data to flow across the industry and across the transaction and that's the thing that hasn't happened and mm -hmm. um, we've literally had one one project which is the local land charges project which is run by land registry and um, where they've taken the local authority search for 100 local authorities and digitize that one piece of data and that's as far as we've got since 2018 wow. um which is, which is yeah pretty shocking so because we haven't digitized at source and then all we've had you know for the last five years is we've had multiple black swan events if you think you know we've had covid we've had cost of living crisis we've had ukraine war we've had this we've had that we've had the other all we've done is compounded the issue because then we've had to react very quickly to enable people to work from home, to not have the same levels of productivity. We've had lots of people who've exited the market, especially in things like conveyancing. Um, and all we've done then is compounded what was already quite a busy market, stamp duty, holiday, cliff edges, like literally everything you could have thrown at the system to make it slower We've literally had all of them in the last five years, which is why yes. we're now at 22 weeks. It's just compounded after compounded after compounded. And yeah, that's that's why we are where we are. Um, so we've not fixed that kind of fundamental underlying issue of solving how we digitize the data at source and how we enable data to flow. So we're still stuck in this, what is essentially a paper-based manual process where each person does their own bit of the journey and then passes it on to the next person in the chain. And it's just really inefficient. Interesting. Yeah. So the role of um, Open Property Data Association is to effectively kind of bring together all the, the stakeholders. Um, I've recently been reading um, John Reynolds book, Digital Bricks and Mortar, and, and it's, it's all about kind of what he terms uh, bringing together a golden thread of information, which is basically kind of making the whole process effectively seamless where all the different stakeholders are all kind of collaborating together. Is that, is that a kind of fair summary of what it's all about? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So the when Home Buying Selling Group asked me to get involved in this, um, they had um, pulled together something called a buyer and seller property information and um, the BASPI. And the intention of that was to try and identify what data we actually needed for the whole of the transaction to work and for that data to be available up front. So they've created this um, question set of these are all the things that the buyer and seller need to know up front. Mm -hmm. And they've done some guerrilla testing um, with some estate agents and conveyances to say, would this work? How would you use it in your business? Like, what impact does it have on your customer? Um, so they got some people to trial it, and that that was really insightful. Um, in that, yes, the data definitely helped in doing things like and the seller instructing the conveyancer up front, getting the title and the deeds and the searches up front definitely helped mm. to improve the, the the kind of efficiency of the transaction. 
But what they realized was that actually having it as a question set meant that it wasn't easy to share. And if you think, you know, we try not to talk about hips because we know lots of people were um, scarred by what happened back in the day. Um, but it was essentially that's what it would have ended up becoming. It would have ended up becoming a kind of file of things that weren't shareable and not actually fixing the process. So that was where this started. They asked me to look at the BASB. This is four years ago. So like, can you look at the BASB? Could this be digitized in the same way that you did with digital mortgages? And of course, the answer is yes, you can digitize anything in today's day and age because the technology exists to do that quite easily. But what we found when we started digging under the content of the BASB was that there's a much broader set of data that you actually need for everyone to do their bit of the process, especially like mortgage lender, and to improve things like fraud and to make things like PI cover better. So things like digital identity and um, how you do source of funds, how you do the transfer of the completion payment and registration of title. So there's kind of a, a broader set of data that was needed, mm -hmm. but also that's how we uncovered that none of the data was actually digital at source. But also even where we do have um, electronic or data that we could digitize, what we don't have as an industry is that ecosystem that underpins it. So given that I've got a background in travel, this is my analogy because this works for me. I'm quite a visual person. So yeah. if you think if you travel from any airport in the UK to wherever you're going on your holidays this summer, Every airport, every airline, doesn't matter which airline you fly with, they all have to use the same three letter code for the airport. They all have to use the same way of identifying the aircraft, the same structure for your ticketing information. So you know what seat you're sat in, where you're going from and to, which airline you're traveling with, et cetera. Mm. Um, when you do your check in, it's the same QR codes. When you go to the gate to get through passport control, it's the same e reader. And everybody has to connect to air traffic control because otherwise, like, planes would fall out of the sky. And if we didn't all use the same barcodes for scanning your luggage or for scanning the same QR code for your ticket, like, you would land up in one place and your luggage would likely end up somewhere else. So that that infrastructure is actually a set of open standards that okay. everybody has to agree to. It doesn't matter which airline you are or where you're traveling to or what country you're in. Everybody has a common set of standards and we don't have that for property. But those standards are also used for everything that we do in our technology life today. Any digital service that you use from Google Maps to Uber Eats to anything mm -hmm. um, is all independent, like most of the Internet is. And even you, we even talk about, you know, really humble things like John mentions in his book, like a three point plug. And yeah, it's an interesting analogy. Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. So we, and we don't have that for property, and but it's also the thing that underpinned open banking was to create a set of standards. So it blew, it absolutely blew my mind. I had one of those light bulb moments where you're like, "Oh my god, this is like one of the biggest purchases that people ever make in their life." It's one of the biggest impact areas for customers on health, well-being, their financial well-being, and it's like the scariest, one of the scariest transactions to do. It's one of the most stressful. And it has absolutely nothing to underpin it. There's no yeah. ecosystem. There's no infrastructure. There's no data standards. There's no common standard that everybody adheres to. We talk about everything in different languages with different technology. And then you're like, well, no wonder the system's completely bunged up yeah. because none of the systems can talk to each other. Yeah. So so we did um we we got a bunch of volunteers together um who were amazing and people who are much more technical and data led than I am. Um, and this is what we did all of this, un, you know, discovery and we presented all of this back to the home buying and selling group. And then we were like, we actually need to fix this. So we volunteered to create a draft schema and to create a data dictionary and to create the open standards. And then those early companies who were involved in doing that work were like, actually, why don't we take this one step further and do a proof of concept and actually connect our systems together and show right. how this data would flow. And that's what we did. So we did one proof of concept and we used my property in County Durham as the guinea pig. And oh, I actually right. was selling that most of the time. So proper money where your mouth is stuff. <laughs> it's um, in the game. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and then and then we did a closed beta test with 120 live customers um, to see what happened with their transactions. And then on the back of that evidence, we were like, okay, we really need to do this in anger. Um, so 12 months ago, about well, 14 months ago now, we launched the Open Property Data Association as a trade association and as the custodians 
of the work that we're doing and to help drive the adoption and to work with government on what data needs to be digitized first and how we get all of this stuff to work, like how we build that framework and how we build the infrastructure together. So yeah, that's what we've been, that's how we ended up with the OPDA. Interesting. And so the schema you mentioned, that's effectively um, a kind of, uh, is that a database of where every, which all different the different stakeholders can effectively access. How would you describe what a schema is? I know it's, it's a bit of a weird one, but it's used in kind of search engine optimization. So um, you can understand. So the search engine can understand what the what the website content is all about. You know, uh, and so it's kind of uniform kind of uh, technology that uh, or code or whatever the term is. I'm not obviously I'm not a technical person, but yeah. How would you describe what schema is? Is that is that something that a common language that everyone can kind of use, um, which will have information exactly with right regards to a property? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. So if you think about like it's a big data dictionary right. that uses a common language. We happen to use JSON, which is the most common language for computing in the world. So we mm -hmm. use JSON because it was the most obvious one to use. And what it does is it sets out in lines of code that when you are collecting, for example, the title from land registry and the deeds and the searches from the different search organizations, that this is how you represent that piece of data. So if you're collecting the title number, your title number should be in this format and have these numbers, these letters and be in this kind of string format or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And it's literally it's like 50,000 lines of schema code that says for every Every piece of information that's needed to get a transaction from A to B, this is how you represent that data point. The mm. second bit of it is also then having a common API spec. So an API is just the way that computers connect to each other and how they share the data. So if computer A collects the land registry title and wants to share it with computer B, having a common API spec is just means that everybody builds the API the same way and that all of those computers can then share that piece of data without anybody having to physically input it or check it or anything so computer a knows where they got it from and they can share it with computer b and when computer b receives it they can understand what it is and it's in a format that they're expecting so it just makes the data flow really seamlessly between systems so that's points one and two point three are then how you enable how you attach trust to the data so if you think if you had a piece of data you need to put a label on it that says not only is it in the format that you expect to it to be in but to prove where that piece of data came from so if you've collected the land registry title in the deed you need to be able to show that it came from land registry so the next person or the next computer can go i recognize this as land registry data and i can prove that this came from land registry right. therefore i can trust it because yeah. this data has provenance it's been authenticated and i can track this data back to its source and that's a really important piece of this because even without that, it, it's then not trustable and shareable. So if you think today, when you do the process today, if you need to do, um, I don't know, searches or your identity, you currently do that multiple times in the transaction yeah, like because if the, the estate the does it, your identity, the mortgage company does conveyance, it. Conveyance, I can't trust it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And that's because you can't provenance where it's being done or how it's being done. So this that the, the whole point of the scheme is to fix those kind of fundamental things. Mm, interesting and also it means that you know um with all the information there in one place you can kind of prevent things like fall throughs you know buyers know exactly what they're looking at when they're approaching a property and it's not down to conveyance to kind of reveal this information when you're six weeks into the sale then the buyer realizes oh okay well i didn't know about that when i initially purchased the property or made the offer on the property and things kind of fall apart so i think it's going to get rid of a lot of the kind of tensions that happen in the industry from day to day, you know, so that's, uh, that's really interesting. So um, how easy have you found it to kind of implement a lot of these kind of um, these concepts into the industry? Because, I mean, obviously the property industry is notoriously slow moving. What are the main obstacles you, you feel are in place that are preventing from this being fully rolled out into the sector? Has there been a lot of kind of um you know a lot of kind of stakeholders holding back or you know have you have you found it you know is it is, are people being open-minded to these kind of changes well I, I guess as you'd expect there's a bit you know there's one extreme to the other um so we've got our 
volunteer group and now our membership who are um, committed to making this happen have been on the journey and understand what this means and 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 kind of understand the what we mean by schema and what we mean by data standards and and um, people get very hung up on oh but you're going to centralize the data and what happens to control and like you have to you have to do a lot of explaining that this is not about centralizing data land registry data will always live in land registry call authority data will always live with the call authority local searches will always live with the local authority mm. all we're doing is making it common and easy to read and enabling that data to be collected and shared in a way that's trustable so a lot of the challenges actually around people even understanding what we mean by open standards and schema and digitization and and a lot of the the pushback that i get is oh but this is all about just you know tech and and enabling prop tech to take over the world and like it's so not that it's actually what you just described which is how do we make the consumer journey better and give customers better access to their own data about their own properties? Mm. So most people who put their house on the market for sale, most sellers, when you say to them, well, you know, do you have any restrictions on your title? What is your tenure? I mean, how would a customer, like a normal person, like how would you expect them to know that? And why are we even asking them the question when actually that data lives in an official source? So, yeah, this is actually the 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 challenges are around getting people to understand what this actually is and isn't but also the industry's worked this way for over 100 years and you're asking them to make this huge mind shift and big cultural change to going how do you enable something that's customer centric and not driven by existing process and forms based thinking and our paper based journey that everybody is very wedded to today so we have people who are huge advocates and um, one of the biggest successes we've had this year are having tier one banks who are now joining and um, so we've announced Lloyds Banking Group and all of their brands we announced Nationwide a few weeks ago and we have some others that we'll be announcing very very shortly but right. some of the biggest high street brands in the here, like on the market, Alto Zupla, Cordu, um, and and really clever startups like Movali, Catini. There's a whole bunch of them. So mm. we've got people who are absolutely committed to making this happen, but then we've got people who are, you know, really fearful that this is a big change, and there's a cost associated with that change, especially if you're working with legacy technology. And if you don't understand the concept of an open framework, it's like it feels big and it feels scary and people are worried about it. So I'd say we've got every extreme and everything in between in terms of, of barriers. Yeah. And so how specifically will you be working with, um, you know, these these massive lenders like Lloyds Banking Group and, and Nationwide? Are they going to be adapting their legacy systems um, in line with what you're proposing at the OPDA? Yeah, so um, both of those have publicly committed that that's exactly what they're going to do. Um, they were already digitizing their own platforms anyway, as you'd expect, because that's something that they need to do for their own businesses. Um, so as they are updating anything to do with their mortgage journey, property journey, property back book, they will implement the open standards. But they're also very engaged in all of the working groups that we sit on across government and internally and with the industry as we start designing what does the trust and interoperability framework look like? How do we do digital identity? Like, what does that actually look like in practice? What does it mean for the customer? What does it mean for the user? How do we make sure that we do it to the highest level that's absolutely possible? Where does that fit with the recent legislation around the digital information and smart data bill, which enables customers to be able to do that? So the lenders are really engaged in those workshops along with all of our other members. So they're literally designing what the future future of all of these processes is going to look like and then helping us to write the standards to then drop in the schema and making them open and available for everyone makes sense so um is that the property data trust framework that you all kind of work is that the kind of uh, makes sense makes sense okay and um in terms of um the, the government's involvement i know there was the smart data roadmap from the department of business and trade um yeah. was that in April this year I think so something like that uh, uh, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah um it so um and and, and the government have, have started to fund um this 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 particular part of the industry so how, how have things been going with that I mean I know the election may have changed things but how have things been going in terms of government support for for what for what you're doing 
Yeah, and the government departments have been amazing. So we have um we have a really close relationship with um the Ministry for Housing Communities and local government. So what was DP um yeah, the what was DLUC um in terms of they're obviously responsible for housing strategy and for what was the leveling up agenda. And obviously that's changed with the incoming government, but the principles of what we're trying to do and to create better experiences and to free up the productivity and the impacts on the economy, because housing is actually one of the biggest contributors to GDP. So for government, it's really important that we actually get it better than it is today. So we've got an amazing relationship with MHCLG around what that strategy looks like for the future of the home buying process and also because land registry um sit under mhclg as well and they're one of the you know kind of primary sources of data we need to work with the stuff on the smart data council is really interesting because the department of business and trade are the ones who helped us to drive what we needed in terms of legislation which is the digital information and smart data bill because that legislation underpins a lot of the work that we need to be done mm. around implementing standards, enabling the reuse of digital identity under the Digital Identity Trust and Attributes Framework. It also enables things like the transition of open banking to open finance, which will include mortgages and things. That, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff that the Bank of England are doing around digitising um, payments and um, synchronising the things like completion and money laundering checks and all of that so that we don't have to physically move money between accounts. Right. Um, and we've also got the, um, the Digital Identity Trust and Attribute Framework, which sits with Department of Science, Innovation and Technology, where once the legislation's been passed all of the way through, that will then enable that overlay scheme on how we do digital identity. So we've got all of these four different government departments who are all very heavily invested in their bit of it. But between the four of them, it joins up the whole of the process for us. So, yeah, our relationship and the support from government's been great. Obviously, we've had a bit of a hiatus over the summer while, you know, general election was happening. And mm -hmm. as ministers have come back in, there's that period of first 100 days while they prioritise what needs to be done first and what legislation needs to be to, to go into the first batch. And thankfully, that digital information bill was included in that. So when they come back in September, we'll then re-establish all of the working groups and start working in anger on the the practical implementation of these things and how we start getting the work done and where the budgets are going to come from for digitizing the source data and that kind of stuff so yeah so from September you're going to see some really fast progress well that's great and it does sound like there's a lot more progress relative to you know what's been happening in recent years you know um things are really stepping up and it's good to see some there's there's some really good momentum so um yeah just kind of drawing things to a close how can people find out about you know, the work that you're doing, the work that, um, you know, um, uh, the BASB kind of developments and what the Home Buying and Selling Council are doing. Um, I guess you, you have a website and that kind of thing. How can people keep in touch with uh, uh, and keep updated with what's going on? No, absolutely. So, um, yes, we have a website um, for MD in the industry who's interested and um, they can do contact us. They can sign up to our newsletter. We post very regularly on LinkedIn and share lots of updates. We also have the Digital Property Market Steering Group, which was also launched last year. And that's all of the industry trade bodies um, and land registry and some of the government departments. And that's our vehicle for doing the um, engagement with all of the others. So we have things like UK Finance, Law Society, Conveyances Association, um, Building Society Association, etc., the DPMSG are kind of the collective body, including OPDA, for driving all of this change through. And they've got a published roadmap with all of the things that need to happen. So the DPMSG, you can follow on LinkedIn too. Um, Home Buy and Selling Council, they also have a website. And again, they post things on LinkedIn. So, But if MD wants to have a bit of a kind of one-to-one -one deep dive into this stuff, just reach out through the website, do a contact us, and we're more than happy to share what we're doing. That's brilliant. Well, really interesting work. Um, that you're doing then it's it's really encouraging considering you know it's crazy that the the industry is actually slowing down in the digital age you know and it's great to see that you know the work that you're doing Maria and and, and your the other organizations that you're involved with um, are doing is, is, is kind of really moving things forward so yeah it'd be great to keep in touch and maybe we can do another few podcasts as, as things progress and uh, you know see see where things things go you know um, we'll to do that. and, and speed up the house sale process which is what we all want 
Yeah. So for us, our goal is to make it really easy for the consumer to make it super transparent so that everybody can see what they need to know and to take all of the friction out of the journey. And if that ends up being that people end up with a better outcome and a better experience, then we've done the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for your time, Maria. Really appreciate it. And I look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me on.